Well, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? It's finally cold. Huzzah. All right, three people enjoy fall weather. That's good. <laughs> awesome. Well, my name is Christina. In case you didn't, didn't know, I am one of the Connect Group leaders here at Nickel City Church. And I am just really excited because we are continuing on with week two of our Overcoming Fear series. Now, if this is your first time here, you're probably wondering what that is. Our Fear series is just um, a time when we talk about some of the most universal fears to plague mankind and how God over helps us over to come them. Um, last week, we talked about how God helps us overcome the fear of failure. And this week, we're going to be tackling probably the most universal fear to plague mankind, and that is the fear of death. Okay, super, super excited. Now, <clears throat> when I was seven years old, I honestly had this crazy experience where I had to come face to face with my own mortality at the tender age of seven. It all happened when I was at school, I was outside during recess, playing around, and lo and behold, I looked down on the ground, and there in front of me was a beautiful brown mushroom. Okay. Now, y'all are sitting here thinking, what's the big deal? It's a mushroom. Keep in mind, I am Canadian, which means that, you know, when I was seven, I immigrated to Canada with my parents, and I immigrated from a desert country, and they don't got no mushrooms growing in the sand there, okay? So for me, this was an amazing experience, seeing a mushroom out in the wild. So there I was, fascinated with this mushroom um, growing. And of course, being the curious seven-year-old that I was, I decided to reach down and kind of give it a good touch, you know, figure out what it felt like. And the only thing I really knew about mushrooms is that they're kind of edible. So I, I gave it a good touch, and then I brought my hand up to my face, and I just kind of licked it. I, I guess I thought in my head that I would get the taste or the essence of mushroom, but really my hand just tasted like dirt. It wasn't very pleasant at all. And if that wasn't bad enough, <clears throat> after licking kind of that mushroom, I went back to class and one of my friends told me, she's like, Christina, you know that mushrooms are poisonous, right? That's gonna kill you. And of course, being the seven-year-old who had just immigrated and never seen a mushroom, I freaked out, okay? I went home completely convinced that I was going to die. I told my mom, I told my dad, they're over there, by the way. I told them that I was gonna die, and I started crying, and for some reason, they just did not seem concerned. They were the least apathetic parents of all time. There I was, going through an existential crisis, and nobody cared. Anyway, I went to bed and I literally cried myself to sleep, hoping that I would live to see another day. Bet you can't guess how that turned out. <laughs> I'm alive! Huzzah! <laughs> the mushroom was not the death of me, okay? I did not die by mushroom. That would have been a very sad way to go. But riddle me this. It's been 20 years since that fateful day and I'm still thinking about it. I can still remember how terrified I was as a kid at the prospect of dying. 20 years later, and it's still ingrained in my memory. Now, maybe none of you guys have ever eaten a poisonous mushroom, but I'm pretty sure that all of us here can probably relate or at least understand that fear of dying. Right? Most of us don't like to sit here and think about the fact that one day we will no longer be on this earth. We don't like to think about our own mortality. And if you're sitting here and you're thinking, uh, this is making me uncomfortable, I don't like it, I don't like where this is going, trust me, you're not alone. In fact, I'd venture so far as to say that it's almost, in some ways, biblical to feel uncomfortable about death. Because you see, death was never part of God's original design for us. God never intended death to be a part of the human story. How do we know this? Well, let's go to the book of Genesis. In this um, book, God creates the first humans, Adam and Eve, and he places them in this beautiful, perfect garden called Eden. And he tells Adam that, you know, you can eat of any tree that you want, any fruit of any tree, except 
the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Well, of course, Adam and Eve didn't listen. They disobey God. They eat the fruit from the tree. And in doing so, they unleash this massive curse upon both themselves and literally the rest of humanity to follow. That curse was called sin and death. Romans 5.12 says this, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. From the moment an Adam and Eve ate that fruit, they allowed sin and death to enter the world. And every person since then has been afflicted with that curse. The good news, however, is that sin and death don't have the final word. God doesn't allow humanity to stay in this cursed position. He sends his son, Jesus, to live as one of us and ultimately to experience death just as we do. And so with that said, today I want to highlight just three simple things, three reasons that we don't need to fear death anymore and three ways that Jesus has released all of us here from the fear of death. First reason is that Jesus tastes death for everyone. You see, Jesus understands our fear of death better than anyone because he had to die too. Hebrews 2, 14 to 15 says this, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Jesus did and experienced what we all eventually one day will have to experience for ourselves. Now, maybe you can kind of relate to this. Now, my husband and I, we are of Indian descent. And ever since moving to Buffalo from Canada, I was appalled to realize that most Buffalonians have never tried Indian food. Okay, this is a travesty. In Canada, you walk half a block, you'll find like 10 Indian places. (coughs) So, my husband and I have made it our sole mission in life to introduce as many of our friends to Indian food as is humanly possible. And among that group of friends is our beloved pastor, Eli. And he's not here, so I have full ring to make fun of him. Okay. Now, Eli is going to tell you that he's not picky, and he's open to trying anything and everything. And he's, he's chill, man. He is not. That is a bold-faced lie. Okay, Eli is one of the most pickiest, skeptical eaters that I have ever met. It took weeks of convincing for Phil and I to actually drag him to the Indian buffet. Deanna, you are not included in this. So we take Eli out for Indian food. And, of course, he's skeptical the whole time. And the only way to kind of maybe calm him down is for Phil um, to kind of, he dragged him, and he literally went through every single dish and told him what was in it and what kind of curry it was and what condiments are good. And, oh, this is too spicy. Don't try that. Phil pretty much had to give him, like, a four-star Yelp review of every single dish before Eli was somewhat comfortable trying it. Well, eventually he tried pretty much everything. And out of everything there, he found one thing that he liked, butter chicken. So if you've never tried Indian food, butter chicken has Eli's stamp of approval. (laughs) Try butter chicken. (laughs) Now, as, as skeptical and as picky as Eli was, he trusted Phil and I. And he trusted us because we know Indian food. Okay, we grew up with it. We ate it. We have experienced it. And because we experienced it, he trusted our word. He knew that our experience wouldn't lead him astray. Well, this is exactly what Jesus does for us. You see, Jesus doesn't just tell his people to suck it up and get over your fear of death, people. He walks a mile in our shoes, and he willingly experiences the mental and the physical and the emotional pain of death 
In fact, just before he was crucified, Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's so anxious about his impending death that he literally sweats drops of blood. In Luke twenty two forty two, he even prays and asks God, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. See, Jesus was not looking forward to death. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. He knew that he would be betrayed, insulted, stripped naked, scourged, and ultimately nailed to a cross where he would literally asphyxiate to death. But he also knew that he needed to do it for our freedom. He went before us. He experienced the same thing that we did. And because he did that, we can trust him because he's done it. Jesus didn't just talk the talk. He went to the cross and he showed us by example that death doesn't have the final word. And so the first reason that we can trust Jesus and look to him to overcome our fear of death is because he has tasted death for everyone. The second reason is that Jesus conquers physical death. 1 Corinthians 15 says this, Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. In this passage, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's encouraging them. He's telling them, listen, Jesus has risen from the dead. In fact, he didn't just rise and appear to the people who knew him. He's appeared to 500 others, including myself. Why does Paul say this? What's so important about the resurrection anyway? Well, Paul is trying to make a point. He's trying to prove that Jesus truly has complete power and authority over death. You see, Jesus, throughout his earthly ministry and all throughout the Gospels, makes these audacious claims. He makes these really crazy statements. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. John 10, 18, no one can take my life away from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. Jesus is literally telling all those who listen to him that he is the source of life. But imagine how silly it would be if after saying all these big things, Jesus then got crucified, got buried, and then failed to rise again. Pretty weak. His words would have carried no meaning. Who's going to believe that you're the source of life if you stay dead? Right? It's like when I go to a mall and I look at those store windows that say 50% off and I get really excited and I run into that store that I would never go to and suddenly I read the fine print and it goes 50% off of the $1,000 socks or 50% off if you buy three items of the same thing. See, people love to make big, bold claims, but very rarely do they actually follow through with it. And so we've learned to distrust people in their words and their claims. But Jesus doesn't just toss around his words and then retract them or, or tweak them a little bit. He follows through. He goes to the cross and he rises from the dead. And that's amazing news for us because it means that when we put our faith in Jesus, we know that his words carry meaning. Now, maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, well, I wasn't part of that 500 who saw Jesus with their physical eyes. Okay, I've never actually seen Jesus in the flesh. That's okay. I guarantee you, many of us sitting here today have encountered Jesus. You may not have seen him with your physical eyes, but believe me, you have seen him. 
talk to some of the people in this room. So many of us have amazing testimonies, amazing stories of how Jesus has intervened in our lives. Maybe you were struggling with an addiction and you tried for years and years to get rid of it and you couldn't. And suddenly Jesus walks into your life and pretty soon you have the power to face that thing head on and achieve victory over it. Or maybe Jesus intervened in your failing marriage and he repaired it. Maybe Jesus brought you comfort when you were depressed and no one knew. Or he healed you of the physical illnesses that the doctor said was next to impossible. There are so many of us who are here today because we have personally experienced Jesus' intervening and saving power. And guys, the reason that Jesus could even do any of those things is because he's still alive right? Jesus doesn't stay dead. At this very moment, the Bible says Jesus is right now at the right hand of God interceding for us. We don't worship and sing songs and pray to someone who's still rotting in a grave somewhere. That person has no power to save us, but we pray to a living God who hears us and even now intervenes on our behalf. So the first reason that we don't need to fear death is because Jesus has already experienced it for us. The second is that he's conquered physical death. And the third and final reason that Jesus releases us from the fear of death is because he has conquered something far greater than physical death. He's conquered spiritual death. You see, the Bible actually mentions two different types of death. The first is physical. It's when your body dies and it decays and it's in the ground. But the second is spiritual death. And as scary and terrifying as physical death is for a lot of us here, believe me, the Bible actually says that spiritual death is a fate far worse than physical death. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 12. He tells his disciples, I'm speaking to you as dear friends. Don't be bluffed into silence or insincerities by the threats of religious bullies. True, they can kill you, but then what can they do? There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, your body and soul in his hands. Now, as I said, when Adam and Eve ate that fruit in the garden, all of humanity immediately became enslaved to this disease called sin, including you and me. Now, the problem with that is that the minute we became slaves to sin, we automatically became separated from God without any hope of rescuing ourselves. Our good works, by the way, mean nothing. When you line them up against God's standard of perfection, they fall short every time. In fact, the Bible says that we were so separated from God that we are actually considered dead in our sins. Colossians 2 says this, You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Ephesians says the same thing. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. The Bible says that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's standard. And because of that, each one of us here deserves death. And not just physical death, but permanent, eternal separation from God. Maybe some of you here can kind of get what I'm talking about because, you see, there's more, more than one way to be dead. There are people in here right now, there are people out there right now who are alive as you and me. They are walking, they are talking, they are breathing, and they'll probably live another 80 years. But inwardly, they're dead. They have no life in them. Maybe you're sitting here and you know exactly what it means to be dead in sin. Maybe before Jesus, your life was a mess. Maybe you were struggling with something or just going through the motions. Or maybe you kept trying to fill this empty void with things like money or fame or recognition. And you realize that ultimately, none of those things satisfied. Listen, if that's you here today, 
It doesn't have to be. The good news is that through a relationship with Jesus, he comes in and he fills that void. Now, we are the ones that deserved punishment and death. But Jesus is the one who ultimately pays the price for our sin. He restores our relationship with God. And his sacrifice makes a way for us to experience spiritual life. Ephesians 2 says this, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Now think about this. If Jesus died and rose from the grave only to prove that there was an afterlife, that would be pretty bad for all of us here. Think about it, right? Jesus goes to the cross. He dies. He goes in the grave. Three days later, he rises again, and then he shows up to his disciples and goes, hey, guys, what's up? It's me, Jesus. I rose from the dead. I'm going to heaven to be with my father. Oh, yeah, by the way, you guys are still sinners, so y'all can't come ever. Sorry, bye. What's the point of that? No, Jesus' death and resurrection does more than just give us proof of an afterlife. His death actually makes a way for us to be reconciled with God. Romans 5 says this, For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Christ's death and his resurrection assures us that we have life, not just life after death, but life in the here and now. Jesus says the devil comes to um, steal, kill, and destroy, but he comes to give us life and life to the fullest. Even now, Jesus gives us life, real life. And so, again, three reasons that we can have hope. First is Jesus has experienced death. He gets it. The second is that he's conquered physical death. And the third is that Jesus has conquered spiritual death. Now, as a society, there seems to be this general consensus that aging and death are terrifying, right? We look at the beauty industry. There is every cream out there to get rid of your wrinkles, to get rid of your gray hairs, to make you look 10 years younger. We look at Hollywood. All the famous people either are young or look a lot younger than they should. Or look in the movie industry. There's been a recent upsurge in superhero movies, right? These people who have healing abilities and, and are, have super strength, and somehow they're immune to things like aging and disease, or because of their special abilities, they don't experience death in the same way, or they get to postpone death for as long as they want. Everything in our society pretty much tells us that death is scary and death needs to be avoided and we need to resist death for as long as possible. But Jesus tells us something different. He tells us that death isn't something to fear because he has overcome it in every sense of the word. Jesus has the last word. It is finished. And so with that, I want to share just two quick ways that we can apply this knowledge into our lives today. What does it mean? What's, why is it so important that we know that Jesus has overcome death? Well, the first reason is that we can have hope. You see, if you have put your faith in Jesus, death is not the end of your story. It never will be. In fact, Jesus promises that if you believe in him, when you die, you will be reunited with him. It's a party. It's a celebration. It's not the end. John 14 says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. There's a lot that the Bible has to say about heaven. Tons. Read it. But ultimately, the greatest part about it is that we will be with the one we love and the one who 
who loved us enough to give his life for us. We will be eternally connected to the source of life and love itself. Just knowing that alone should be cause for celebration. So don't look at death as the final ending. Look forward to it. Be bold. Be happy even. Crazy, I know, right? <coughs> it's a reunion. It's a party. So we can have hope. And the second thing that we can do is that we can comfort others. If we are confident about what happens to us when we die, we owe it to the people around us to share this information. Maybe you know someone who's mourning the death of a loved one. Or maybe you know someone who's terrified of death. Maybe you know somebody who's alive and breathing, but inwardly, they have no life. Maybe it's you. Maybe you can be that voice of comfort, encouraging them, assuring them that through Jesus, death doesn't have the final word. It doesn't need to. You can share with them the fact that Jesus is life itself. He is the resurrection. Maybe you're sitting here and you don't know where you're going to go when you die. Maybe it terrifies you. And listen, it doesn't need to. All you really need to be assured of where you're going is to have a relationship with Jesus. Talk to him. Tell him in your heart that you want a relationship with him, that you believe that he died and that he rose again, and that you want to be reunited with him when that day comes. As we get ready to close, I just want to take like one second to read a very, very popular scripture verse over all of us and pray. Maybe you've heard this verse a bunch before, but I want you to meditate upon it. Let the words wash over you. It's John 3.16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I'm going to read it again. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Death doesn't have final word. Jesus does. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for sending your one and only son for us. We thank you so much, Jesus, that you willingly took on human flesh, that you walked like we do. You experienced pain and hunger and fatigue and ultimately, you experienced a violent, horrible death. Jesus, you paid the price for our sin, even though we were the ones deserving of punishment. God, I thank you for your word, which says that you made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, so that in him, we would become the righteousness of God. Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you that because of what you did on the cross, we know that we can trust you because you have experienced death. You went before us. Thank you that you conquered physical death. You rose from the grave. You didn't stay dead. And even now, you are interceding on our behalf. And Jesus, thank you that most of all, you have given us spiritual life. We are no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to sin. We are children, and we are adopted into your family. God, I just pray for every person in this room. I pray that those who are afraid of death, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them and give them a new hope in you, that they wouldn't see death as an ending but as a beginning. God, I pray for those who have lost loved ones, who are mourning. God, that you would comfort them. Your word says that you are close to the brokenhearted, and you save those who are crushed in spirit. So I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would encourage them in whatever they're dealing with. And Lord, I pray for each person here who knows 
that they are going to be reunited with you. I pray that you would give them that urgency to share this message, to share the good news with others, and to tell them about what you have done for each person here. God, we thank you so much. Thank you that you have the last word and that death is not the end of our story. We love you, God, and we praise you. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much, guys. Um, Thanks for coming out today. We have, again, Connect Group is happening this Wednesday night. Um, We're going to have an amazing movie. It's going to be great. As I mentioned, there will be snacks. Um, It's been a packed house, so please come out to that Wednesday night. And um, again, if you're new here and you want to connect with anybody, please make a stop at our connections table over there, and we'd be happy to chat with you and just get to know you. Thanks for coming, guys. Have a good one.